Good evening, everybody. My name is Jacob Begard, and I am the program manager of the Common Ground Initiative here at the Hauenstein Center for Presidential Studies. On behalf of Gleaves Whitney, our director, and all the stakeholders here at the center, and on behalf of our partners, Joe and Donna Calvaruso of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, and Elaine Didier of the Ford Presidential Museum and Library, thank you all for attending this evening. I want to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished guests this evening, Board of Trustee Member Randy Damstra, Grand Valley Senior Management Team, elected officials, members of the Hauenstein Center Advisory Cabinet and <clears throat> Executive Board, as well as the Hauenstein family. In addition to the Hauenstein family, I'd like to thank all of our donors who contribute to the center so graciously, making world-class programs like this possible. As many of you know, Congress stipulates that public universities hold educational programming in honor of Constitution Day every year. As many of you also know, the Hauenstein Center has been celebrating Constitution Day since its inception in 2003. We are delighted to be the stewards of that here at Grand Valley. I know what some of you are thinking. Shoot, I forgot to bring my pocket Constitution with me. <laughs> and well, if we missed you on the way in, pick one up on the way out, as we do have pocket Constitutions available at our registration table. Here at the Hauenstein Center, we have a mission to do four things. First, we deliberate on the presidency. Second, we debate the issues of the day in our Common Ground Initiative. Third, we develop the next generation of leaders in our Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy. And fourth, we disseminate the life and legacy of our namesake, Colonel Ralph W. Hauenstein. Those who regularly attend our events know we enjoy sharing the stage with our CLA candidates. In a segment we call our Leadership Minute, our candidates give us the opportunity to see their heart for leadership. Tonight's Leadership Minute will be given by Ellie Hardenden, a six-year student studying elementary and special education. Please help me welcome Ellie to the podium. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ellie Hardenden, and I'm a second year Cook Leadership Academy Fellow candidate this is my sixth year at Grand Valley State University studying special education and elementary education with endorsements in emotional impairments and cognitive impairments. Doing nothing is a great way to change nothing. Kid President. Similar to all fellow candidates, I have a desire to be an effective leader. Cook Leadership Academy provides the tools necessary to achieve this goal. Through seminars, wheelhouse talks, leader labs, I have learned who I am as a leader. My mentor, Suzanne Richards, has shaped my views on what it means to be a leader, and more specifically, being an effective leader in education. To me, before you can become one, you must first recognize and acknowledge the traits that define yourself. The Cook Leadership Academy does a wonderful job in providing these opportunities and spaces for myself and other fellow candidates to do just that. For example, Last May, I and 10 other fellow candidates had the unique opportunity to attend the Washington Campus Program in Washington, D.C., sponsored by the Hauenstein Center. The Cook, there we were able to learn from influential leaders at the heart of our nation's capital. One highlight came when we were all able to attend congressional hearings relating to our field of interest. Personally, I was able to pursue educational policy and meet with directors in the Department of Education. I remember walking out of the Department of Education, looking at the Potomac River, thinking, if I do nothing, I can change nothing. I believe it is safe to say that when we all left Washington, D.C., we felt like a flame was ignited within our inner leaders, leaving us inspired and ready to take on the world. I'm Ellie Harnden, and I am a leader. Thank you, Ellie. You do us all proud. Here's how the evening will go down. First, Jeff will give relatively brief prepared remarks, which will be followed by a conversation on stage with our director, Gleaves Whitney. After their conversation, you will have the opportunity to put your best questions to the leading constitutional expert in the nation. Second, Q&A this evening will be done on note cards, which were available at the entrance of the auditorium. If you didn't get one, don't worry. The Hauenstein Center volunteers will be walking around the aisles during the program with note cards. Once you've filled your card out, simply raise your hand and a volunteer will grab the card for you. 
One of the great partnerships the Hanstein Center enjoys is with the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. In fact, this is what President Ford himself had to say about it. I am pleased with the extremely successful partnership between the Ford Presidential Library and Museum, the Ford Foundation, and the Hauenstein Center for Presidential Studies. The Hauenstein Center is making its mark with creative programs that help Americans see beyond the headlines. I'm delighted to work with Gleaves Whitney and his dedicated staff, and his dedicated staff are, as they are doing work to increase the understanding of courageous, effective leadership. It is especially rewarding for the, work, for the work to be with a presidential leadership center so closely associated with my good friend, Ralph Hallenstein, who is an inspiring example of a life well lived. With that, please help me welcome to the stage Joe Calvaruso, the executive director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I echo the comments of Jacob, and I want to thank Gleaves. We have such a wonderful relationship with the Hauenstein Center for Presidential Studies. It just helps augment the things we can do as a museum and a foundation. I'd like to welcome back Jeffrey Rosen. Welcome to Grand Rapids. I was looking back. He's made a number of visits to Grand Rapids, but certainly the most memorable visit was Justice John Paul Stevens with a moderated discussion on President Gerald R. Ford and the Constitution, it certainly was a memorable moment. Jeff is the President and CEO of the National Constitution Center, which is the only constitutionally chartered organization to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. He's a professor of the George Washington School of Law, a contributing editor of The Atlantic, He's a highly regarded journalist whose essays and commentary have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, on National Public Radio, and the New Republic. The Chicago Tribune named him one of the 10 best magazine journalists in America, and a reviewer of the Los Angeles Times called him the nation's most widely read and influential legal commentator. Jeff is also in his spare time the author of six books, including the most recent biography on William Howard Taft, he has also written extensively on the U.S. Supreme Court and the Constitution. Tonight, he will be addressing the future of the Constitution, and I think a sentence that summarizes it, Jeffrey Rosen brings the Constitution to life. Thank you for coming and welcome. Thank you so much, Joe, and ladies and gentlemen, Happy week after Constitution Day. <laughs> it is wonderful to be back in Grand Rapids to celebrate Constitution Day with you. I am here as often as I can be uh, because of your love of the Constitution, because of visionary leaders like Joe Calvaruso at the Ford Museum, like Gleave Whitney at the Common Ground Initiative, whose mission is so closely allied with that of the National Constitution Center and to see my boss, the executive chair of the National Constitution Center, Doug DeVos. <laughs> so I come as often as I can to work with Doug and our phenomenal colleagues to spread the mission of the importance of nonpartisan constitutional dialogue, to bring together citizens of different perspectives to explore areas of agreement and disagreement about this great document of human freedom which binds us. And that's why I'm so honored to be here to talk about the future of Constitution with you tonight. Uh, there's only one request that I have for tonight's discussion, which is the same one that I make to my law students when we talk about the Constitution, and that is I would like us to set aside our political views. In this room, we will no doubt disagree about politics and about the merits of the various policy clashes that are transfixing America. Instead, I want us to debate issues in constitutional rather than political terms. In other words, we have to ask not what we think the government should do, but what the Constitution allows or forbids it to do. And by thinking about issues in constitutional terms, we run the possibility that we might reach a constitutional conclusion that diverges from our political views. We might think that uh, gun control is a terrible idea, but the Second Amendment allows it, 
or that gun control is a great idea, but the Second Amendment forbids it. And that's really what we're trying to teach at the Constitution Center. And that approach is embodied on this wonderful new web platform that I just have to tell you about before we start, because I want you all to check it out. Not now, because you have to listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> but after the show. And it's called the Interactive Constitution. You can find it as an app in the App Store and at constitutioncenter.org. And it brings together the leading liberal, conservative, and libertarian scholars in America to write about every clause of the Constitution, describing areas of agreement and disagreement. It is thrilling to be able to learn about uh, clauses and to find unexpected areas of agreement and disagreement. I learn from it every time I check it out. And it's gotten 25 million hits since it launched in 2015. And as a result, the Constitution Center is now the fifth most visited museum website in the country. That's because, as one of you was saying to me earlier tonight, never before in our lifetime have people been so eager, hungry, to learn about the Constitution. Never have constitutional issues been so front and center. And never have we seen every day in the news some new constitutional question. Hours before we gathered tonight, Speaker Nancy Pelosi stood in Congress and invoked the framers standing in front of Independence Hall and said that the House of Representatives was going to begin impeachment proceedings against the President of the United States. Uh, we are seeing the fundamental clashes between the branches where Congress is insisting it has the power to demand information from the President and the President says that his executive powers uh, forbid him from turning the material over. And we're seeing fundamental clashes that are being resolved by the Supreme Court on issues ranging from whether the President can uh, impose the travel ban to whether he can add the citizenship question to the census. How can we make sense as citizens, as fellow learners about the Constitution of this remarkable moment that we are experiencing together? What I want to suggest to you tonight, and then I'm eager for your thoughts, is that we are experiencing the fourth battle for the Constitution in American history. These are not just skirmishes. These are not just disagreements. What we're experiencing is a national debate about whether or not we should resurrect a constitution based on original understanding, reimposing limits on executive, congressional, and judicial power that have been dormant since the New Deal era, or whether we should embrace a, co a, a constitution of, uh, of living uh, constitutionalism that would maintain a more expansive notion of federal power that has been taken for granted since uh, 1937. When I said that there have been four battles, I think that this one follows on the heels of the previous three. The first one, of course, was the battle for the Constitution itself. It began with the Declaration of independence and the entire theory of American government is contained in the second sentence of the Declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, and that whenever government threatens these rights, it is the right and duty of the people to alter and abolish it. If you had to come up with a single beautiful, poetic sentence that expresses the American creed, that would be it. But to make real the promise of the Declaration was the subject of the next three battles for the Constitution. The first one was about creating a Constitution and federal government strong enough to maintain a union, to uh, raise defenses and resources to support national purposes, but constrained enough to protect liberty. The second battle for the Constitution was one that was based on Lincoln's promise at Gettysburg to make Jefferson's promise in the Declaration a reality. De Jefferson said that all men are created equal, and yet that promise was thwarted by the institution of slavery. And to efface that sin, the Great Civil War was necessary, and it culminated in the three post-Civil War amendments to the Constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which ended slavery, which guaranteed to all persons equal protection, and the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed to African American men the right to vote. But the promise of the second battle was itself thwarted by the reaction known as redemption 
and the racist terror and resistance both by mobs and by the Supreme Court itself, which struck down many of the pillars of Reconstruction and upheld segregation in the Plessy versus Ferguson decision over John Marshall Harlan's immortal dissent. The third battle for the Constitution began in the progressive era, but really came to a head during the New Deal. And during the court packing crisis in 1937, Franklin Roosevelt threatened to pack the Supreme Court with justices sympathetic to his program because he accused the court of imposing a horse and buggy jurisprudence in striking down many of the pillars of the New Deal uh, on the grounds that they transgressed Congress's authority to delegate author uh, executive power to the president. Uh, in the face of Roosevelt's threats, the Supreme Court backed down in the famous switch in time that saved nine. Justice Owen Roberts changed his vote. He had been voting to strike down the New Deal. Instead, he voted to uphold it. And ever since 1937, we had a vision of very broad federal power with few limits on Congress's power to regulate the economy. The fourth battle for the Constitution began soon after the New Deal, but really uh, began in earnest during the 1980s with the election of President Reagan, who promised to appoint justices to the Supreme Court who would resurrect the original understanding of the Constitution and revive limitations on federal and executive power that had been dormant since the New Deal. In particular, and this may sound wonky, but it's central to the fights that we're fighting today, uh, legal doctrines like the ones that prohibited Congress from delegating too much authority to the president without giving him guidelines about how to exercise it. Essentially, the claim was that many, much of the post-New Deal administrative state, including regulatory agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency or the Consumer Protection Agencies, were operating on grounds that the framers would not have approved. And President Reagan, you'll recall, uh, appointed uh, Robert Bork to the Supreme Court, an originalist justice who was ready to revive the originalist constitution. If he had been confirmed, then the fourth battle would have ended almost as soon as it started. But Bork was not confirmed. Anthony Kennedy, a more moderate conservative, was confirmed in his stead. He was not an originalist. And for the past 30 years, we've had a simmering, uneasy equilibrium on the Supreme Court, where the court has uh, vacillated between um, uh, some originalist decisions and some living constitutionalist decisions with really Kennedy holding the swing vote. Friends, when Justice Kennedy retired last term, his retirement represented not just the retirement of a justice, and not just the possibility of a uh, a, a new um, balance on the court, but the possibility of a new settlement in the fourth battle for the Constitution. Because we now have a court, uh, only two of its justices identify openly as originalists. Those would be Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch, who I'm honored to report is the new chair of the National Constitution Center and came to spend Constitution Day, September 17th, with us. Uh, in Philadelphia, where he talked so powerfully both about his passion for civics and civility and working with the Constitution Center to spread that gospel, and also for his belief in the originalist Constitution, as outlined in his new book, A Republic, If You Can Keep It, and his belief that it was important to revive uh, originalist doctrines that would meaningfully constrain executive, judicial, and legislative power. Uh, right now, uh, Chief Justice Roberts holds the swing vote on the Supreme Court. He is not a self-avowed originalist. He cares deeply about the institutional legitimacy of the court. I had the remarkable experience of interviewing Chief Justice Roberts at the end of his first term as Chief Justice in 2007. I was writing a book for a PBS series about the Supreme Court. The book had the riveting and creative title, The Supreme Court. <laughs> And Roberts is a PBS fan, and he agreed to sit down and talk to me. And he expressed frustration and concern that people were viewing the Supreme Court in political terms. He said that it was bad for the court and bad for the country in a polarized time that uh, citizens thought of the court as Republicans versus Democrats. 
Uh, he noted that America now, according to some measures, is more polarized than at any time since just after the Civil War, confirming the state, the, 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 it's true, it's, it's heartbreaking to think about the passions that have divided us on uh, geographic and ideological grounds, and Roberts said it was so urgently important for the Supreme Court to rise above politics and to be seen as a nonpartisan institution guided instead by law. Roberts has shaped his chief justiceship with this vision. It helps explain his votes in, uh, to uphold the Affordable Care Act, and more recently, just this past term, to uh, refuse to allow the president to add a citizenship question to the census. The chief justice believes, he has indicated publicly uh, and in his opinions, that in close constitutional cases where there are decent arguments on both sides, it is more important that the court be perceived to be acting in a nonpartisan manner than that the most pure originalist constitution, uh, interpretation of the Constitution prevail. And that's why, as long as he remains in the center of the court, we will not see a full-throated revival of the originalist constitution. But now you can understand, uh, we can understand together the stakes in this new presidential election in constitutional rather than purely partisan terms. If President Trump is reelected, he is very likely to uh, be able to replace one of the liberal justices with a conservative. And that would mean at least five, if not six, solid votes for an originalist constitution which would indeed represent a resolution of the fourth battle for the Constitution that's been being waged since the 1980s. Uh, what would that mean in practice? It would mean, first of all, a more constrained federal government. Just last term, Justice Gorsuch the, uh, wrote an opinion in a case called Gundy where he signaled his willingness to revive the non-delegation doctrine. Remember I mentioned that at the beginning, the doctrine that in the 1930s and earlier had said that the Congress can't delegate too much authority to the president without giving him clear guidelines. Uh, for technical reasons, the court didn't uh, fully revive it then, but five justices signaled their willingness to revive it. Uh, and uh, with a six vote, there's no doubt that that would be revived. What would that mean in practice? Well, it would mean that uh, Congress couldn't do things like it did in the Affordable Care Act and say, uh, we are going to regulate health care in this area, and the Secretary of Health and Human Services can fill in the details. Instead, Congress would have to fill them in on its own. Uh, it could also mean that some existing regulations might be questioned on constitutional terms including those involving environmental regulation and climate change. So it would essentially force Congress to either step up to the plate and engage in more detailed uh, legislation or would make it harder to regulate. Uh, critics of the revival of the, the non-delegation doctrine include Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, another one of my heroes who I'm looking forward to talking to uh, Gleave about because I have a new book coming out uh, uh, about her and collecting our conversations over the years. And in a, one of our final interviews for the book, she expressed concern about the revival of the non-delegation doctrine and said, it's unrealistic to expect Congress to anticipate all the complicated applications to regulatory problems in the future. Therefore, uh, she noted that Justice Elena Kagan had said in her uh, opinion objecting to the revival of the non-delegation doctrine, carried to its logical conclusion, this would mean the end of much of government. So you see that the, the stakes, this is not just for lawyers, this is a serious and meaningful and principled disagreement about the scope of federal regulatory authority. Then there are of course the hot button issues that we all uh, most citizens follow in the news from the future of Roe versus Wade to the future of religious liberty and the Second Amendment. And once again, I want you to see these issues not just as in, in, in political terms, but dig into the constitutional arguments in those decisions. Decide whether you think that the Heller case protecting Second Amendment rights was convincing on constitutional grounds or Roe v. Wade. And whether you like uh, reproductive choice or not or like gun rights or not, be prepared to reach a constitutional conclusion that diverges from your political ones. But those are the stakes, and that's one reason why 
it, uh, all, the people who voted for the president in the last election, 25% said that the Supreme Court was the most important factor in their decisions. That was a very smart basis to cast a vote because uh, the, 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 uh, President Trump has appointed originalist judges who are uh, incredibly able, the, the, the ablest in the country, uh, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh, and they will, they have a clear vision, and uh, if you agree with that vision, then, then that's a good reason to cast your vote. What happens if a Democrat wins the next election? Well, then uh, the balance of the court might be maintained. You can imagine the liberal justices being appointed by new uh, and, and younger liberal justices. Uh, and we might see a continuation of the fourth battle for some time to come. But the path may not run so smooth. First of all, Democrats are very energized about the Supreme Court. And a series of Senate Democrats just filed a brief before the Supreme Court in a Second Amendment case endorsing court packing. And several of the leading presidential candidates have also endorsed court packing, suggesting that if the Democrats take the presidency and the Senate, then they should add justices, liberal justices, to the Supreme Court to make up for what they perceive to be the unfairness of not confirming Merrick Garland and to resurrect a kind of balance. Uh, this shows you how direct the analogy with the 1930s is. We're literally seeing a revival of talks about uh, court packing. Now, court packing is, is, uh, didn't work very well the first time. The liberal justices, including my, another one of my heroes, Justice Brandeis, made Congress know that they thought it would destabilize the court. And Justice Ginsburg has also, on record, opposing court packing. Uh, but if there's enough of a majority, it might happen. Now, it would require the Democrats taking not only the White House, but also the Senate. What happens if the Democrats take the White House, but not the Senate? In that case, it's not impossible to imagine the fact that a Republican Senate would refuse to confirm any Democratic nominees. This strikes me as, it struck me as surprising when uh, I first heard about it, but this is, uh, there are Republicans in Washington and Democrats too who think it's not beyond the realm of possibility. Well, what, 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 what would happen then? You could imagine uh, wrenching uh, conflict of the kind that we haven't seen since the court packing era. Would we be in a constitutional crisis? Are we in a constitutional crisis now? Well, then you have to we have to define what, what is a constitutional crisis. Certainly, the first battle for the Constitution was a constitutional crisis. We fought a war. Congress met. It changed the rules under the Articles of Confederation. It came up with a new constitution that was ratified by a two-thirds uh, vote, even though the Articles of Confederation required unanimity. So it was illegal according to the uh, rules of the Articles of Confederation because uh, the people had reverted to the state of nature and called a convention exercising their, their supreme uh, original authority in constitution making. So that was a crisis that culminated in the original constitution. The Civil War, of course, was a constitutional crisis. Uh, it was the bloodiest war in American history. 23,000 dead or wounded at Antietam. And it took that sacrifice to redeem Jefferson's promise and to inscribe equality into the Constitution. And perhaps the New Deal was a constitutional crisis, but uh, maybe it was a constitutional crisis averted because court packing um, was withdrawn. The scholar Keith Whittington defines constitutional crisis narrowly. Uh, first, violence, blood in the streets, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, perhaps the uh, conflicts during the civil rights movement when uh, Go Governor Faubus stood at the courthouse door and, and there was a, th a threat of violence. Uh, second, if the president refuses to obey the law, Andrew Johnson supposedly, although probably didn't say after the Cherokee Indians decision, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. But in fact, the conflict was averted when federal troops were withdrawn and Jackson ultimately did comply. If 
a president were to refuse to comply with a Supreme Court order, the Supreme Court says, turn over the documents, and the president says, I won't, that would be a constitutional crisis. Uh, Britain is engaged in the moment in a constitutional crisis. It is riveting to watch what is going on with Brexit. The first thing to say about Brexit is that it could not have happened in America because we don't make fundamental constitutional decisions by one-off votes, by referenda. That's the whole point of the constitutional system is to slow down deliberation. So you have to jump through lots of hoops before the Constitution can presume to speak in the name of we the people. And the folly of allowing a, the most serious of all constitutional decisions to be made quickly and just with a single popular vote is one that the US thankfully has not made. And the consequences have been dizzying, uh, ranging from the question of who is sovereign. Parliament was supposed to be sovereign, but suddenly the prime minister is trying to uh, shut it down. Uh, the Supreme Court first said, no, Cong uh, Parliament has to bless uh, uh, Brexit before uh, the, par the prime minister can presume to put it through. And just this morning, as if there weren't enough constitutional news, just this morning, the British Supreme Court issued the Marbury versus Madison of Britain. I read it this morning, please read it. It's, I, it's, it was incredibly moving to, to read something where history was being made and in the clearest terms, without legalese or jargon, in uh, clearly crafted paragraphs, the UK Supreme Court essentially said, yes, the, the prime minister ordinarily has the ability to prorogue or uh, disband parliament, but not for the purpose of preventing it from doing its job. Since parliament, not the prime minister, is sovereign, if the prime minister is acting in a way that prevents parliament from doing its job, then he's violating the unwritten constitution. What was so staggering about this decision is first, there, was, there were very few precedents that were cited, except one from the 17th century about the uh, executive not being above the law. The second, there was no written constitution that was being construed. And the third is there's no tradition in Britain of the Supreme Court checking the legislature. The British Supreme Court was only created in 2005. It used to be a committee of the House of Lords, but uh, they created it and now they're modeling themselves on our Supreme Court and in a dizzyingly short amount of time, all 11 justices unanimously asserted a right of judicial review and told the prime minister he couldn't prorogue parliament. So that's a constitutional crisis. We can learn so much from it because it reminds us that for all of our flaws in this country, we have the great virtue of a written constitution where the rules of the road and the rules of debate are clear. We may disagree passionately about whether or not to revive an originalist constitution, but at least we're debating the same text. Justice Kagan, when she introduced Justice Scalia, the late Justice Scalia at Harvard Law School, said we're all originalists now, in the sense that all justices, liberal and conservatives, agree that the text and original understanding of the Constitution is relevant as a good starting point, but then they disagree about how flexibly to interpret that understanding in light of changing times. Justice Ginsburg, in the book, told me, to my surprise, I, I said, you're, you're not an originalist. She said, I am an originalist. I just believe that the founders intended the Constitution to become ever more embraceive. That was her beautiful word and to embrace previously excluded minorities. So we have that virtue. The final definition of a constitutional crisis that Professor Whittington offers up is when the ordinary mechanisms of government break down and the branches grind to a halt. They literally can't do their job. So if there was so much partisan conflict that Congress refused to pass any budgets and the government couldn't function at all, that would be a crisis. Or, to go back to the hypothetical, if the Senate refused to confirm any Democratic nominees and the Supreme Court were unable to function with four justices, or with eight justices rather, that would be a crisis. Now last time they functioned for a year after Justice Scalia's passing with eight justices and, and some of them said eight was fine and in fact allowed them to reach compromise even more than when they had nine because there was an incentive to uh, compromise because when you split four to four, then the lower court decision is affirmed and there's no binding precedent. So maybe eight wouldn't be a constitutional crisis, but imagine there are two vacancies. Seven, you know, you could imagine stalemate that was so great that we could see a form of crisis. 
there are lots of possibilities. We don't know uh, who we, and, and, and the future has many uncertainties. But as we confront the anxious times ahead, I am here to urge you to retain faith in the power of the Constitution to bind Americans despite all of our partisan disagreements. I'm so encouraged when I talk about the Constitution around the country by how fervently both sides cleave to our founding ideals, how that beautiful second sentence of the Declaration, which I began with, continues to define all of our aspirations for the meaning of America, even as we as citizens disagree about precisely how to balance the shining ideals that Jefferson declared, namely liberty, equality, and popular sovereignty. So we can respectfully and civilly have these debates. The stakes are high. We don't have to minimize the seriousness of the choices that confront us, but America will thrive and survive, and ultimately we will remain united. I am convinced of this, that Lincoln's belief, we part as friends, we must not be enemies, will remain vindicated because we can repose in the shining inspiration of the Declaration and the Constitution. Thanks so much, and Cleveland's have a discussion about all this. Thank you. After that? No, I'm great. The, the audience may. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm okay for now. Okay. Well, let me say while we're getting set up here, changing things just a little bit, that I'm really sorry we invited you to town <laughs> no, sure. at a time. Where would you like to sit? Oh, anywhere. This is great. Thanks. Okay. That we invited you to Grand Rapids at a time in our country when there's so little going on. Yes. No. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I mean, what a Constitution Day. Really, yeah. No, I just wanted to start out, first of all, thank you for an insightful and enlightening preamble to what we're about to do here. I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. I'm hoping that you're forming questions and that you'll pass the cards to the aisles where somebody can then bring me the, uh, the questions and then we'll have your participation as well. But I'm struck that not only is it enlightening, intellectually enlightening, what you're providing to these audiences around the country. But it's passionate. I mean, you really believe this. And what you have done at the Constitution Center is just a, a remarkable thing. So I, I said to Jeff earlier today, he's like a brother, because Absolutely. he and I both have this commitment. We in the Common Ground Initiative and some of the things that you've done with your interactive Constitution, which you should have on your phone. I hope you have the app and uh, so many of the other efforts that you have undertaken. Uh, I want to get to some of those initiatives pretty soon, but first, I want to start, I'm holding in my hand the page proofs of Jeff's book that will be coming out November 5th. Now, by my calculation, that's about, what's that, about six weeks before, seven weeks before Christmas. I think this will make a great Christmas present. Or, or Hanukkah. <laughs> or Hanukkah, that's right. <laughs> yes, absolutely. absolutely, let's absolutely. not forget that. Yes. And it's called Conversations with RBG, and the subtitle is Ruth Bader Ginsburg on Life, Love, Liberty, and Law. So we got a little alliteration there, you got the four L's. Jeff, I think you needed a fifth L, longevity. <laughs> absolutely, God, God bless her. You've given us insight into Justice Ginsburg's jurisprudence. Tell us something about her personally and how inspiring she is and how wise she is. I'd love to hear a story or two. Um, I would love to uh, tell it. And uh, uh, the book um, is a complete serendipity. I was so fortunate to have this remarkable relationship with this great personal and constitutional hero. And the book starts off by just telling how I met Justice Ginsburg, which was when I was a young law clerk in 1991 in an elevator. 
So I was a law clerk on the U.S. Court of Appeals. She was a judge on the same court. And she was coming down from her exercise class called Jazzercise. That was, <laughs> that was the 1980s version. And we're in the elevator, and she was completely silent, like a sphinx. She's a very formidable uh, figure, as you know. And she just wouldn't, didn't say anything at all. So I just wanted to break the ice, and I couldn't think of anything to say. And I just asked her what opera she'd seen recently. I love opera. I didn't even know she was an opera fan, but I really like opera, and I just was trying to uh, break the ice. So she just opened up and was so happy to talk about her favorite operas, and that began a conversation about opera that continued throughout the year. The next year, there was a vacancy on the Supreme Court. And as amazing as it is to imagine now, women's groups at the time, some of them were opposing her nomination because she had criticized Roe v. Wade. She said that it was decided too broadly, that it should have been decided more narrowly, and also that it should have been based not on the right to privacy between women and doctors, uh, which she thought was a sort of male-focused uh, and constitutionally unconvincing reasoning, but instead on women's equality. So uh, it wasn't clear uh, how she was uh, doing in this, in this Supreme Court horse race. And I had just visited uh, the US Court of Appeals again. I started as a writer at the New Republic magazine. And the law clerks there told me that Justice Scalia had been there the week before. And someone asked him, if you had to spend the rest of your life locked on a desert island with Mario Cuomo or Bruce Babbitt, who were the Supreme Court front runners, which one would it be? And without missing a beat, he said, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> so I reported that story in the New Republic magazine. And in the course of it, I gave this ringing endorsement of her and said that she was so respected by liberals and conservatives that her appointment would be the most acclaimed since Felix Frankfurter, who had turned her down for a clerkship because he thought he wasn't ready for a woman. And now I said the country was. So Senator Moynihan, who was her champion, mentioned the piece to President Clinton when Clinton was deciding. And Justice Ginsburg generously you know, credited the piece for helping her, along with lots of other things could kind of get over the finish line. And it was just a serendipity, a case of being in the right place at the right time and the fact that I knew this stellar judge. So that began a 25-year correspondence and, and friendship uh, with a bunch of public interviews uh, and private ones too. And about a year ago, I asked her whether I could collect these interviews into a book. And she said, yes, that's a great idea. And she invited my wife, uh, Lauren, and me to spend a weekend with her at the Glimmerglass Opera, which is a dream. Can you imagine anything more exciting than going to the opera with Justice Ginsburg? And we saw West Side Story, and we saw Silent Night, which is a World War I opera. And we saw a lecture by Margaret Atwood, who'd come to talk about the three waves of feminism and the Me Too movement. And I saw Justice Ginsburg and Margaret Atwood talk about their both uh, uh, happiness about the gains of the Me Too movement and also their concerns about some of the excesses of the Me Too movement, in particular concerns about due process for the accused. It was absolutely fascinating to see these uh, feminist giants uh, talking about the costs and, uh, the, the, and, the, and, and benefits of, uh, of, of all this. And I wrote up that story and then, um, I sent her the manuscript, and of course, she became ill last term. And I was praying for her recovery and, and didn't uh, bother her. And then 10 minutes after the Supreme Court term ended in June, I got an email from her saying, I read your manuscript, I've edited it, and I'll have it for you on Monday. <laughs> so I, I, was, I was stunned, completely stunned that with everything that she had going on, that she even remembered it. I showed up, and she, smiling and strong, gave me the manuscript beautifully marked up in her exquisite pencil hand, words and adjectives massaged so that each sentence would be precisely right in her distinctive voice. And I, I was literally stunned that she did it. And I said, how was it possible that you found the time for this little project in the middle of your overwhelming responsibilities and duties? And she said, well, I promised you I'd have it, and I, I wanted to make sure I, I got it to you. And I said, but you know. If you were doing other things. She said, well, I read it in the backs of cars and sometimes in Ubers and stuff. I, I just wanted to make sure I had it. And then I just asked her the question that I've always wondered about, which is the source of her astonishing productivity and focus. And I said, you often tell the story of how your mother told you to overcome 
unproductive emotions like anger and jealousy. Yes, she said. That's the advice of the great wisdom traditions, to set aside these ego-based emotions. But it's very hard to achieve in practice. Yes, she said. How do you actually do it? And she paused and she said, I realized if I don't do it, I will lose precious time for productive work. And I find that so inspiring. And it inspires me every day. Every moment <coughs> I'm tempted to browse Facebook or cat videos or whatever <laughs> may catch my attention, <laughs> as opposed to reading a book or working or focusing or engaging in productive work that can spread light about the Constitution. Uh, I think of this great woman who uses every moment of her day uh, for productive work or elevating leisure to cultivate her faculty. She is she's absolutely a marvel. She's my personal and constitutional hero. I'm so honored to present her in her own words because she's so warm and funny and brilliant and her recall of the details of cases from 50 years ago and her recall of the details of operas from 50 years ago. I, I'll stop now, but I, <laughs> my, my favorite question was I asked her, what are the most memorable opera performances you've ever seen? And she remember them and describe them with great detail. So I'm really excited the book is coming out, and uh, thank you for mentioning it. Well, and obviously she had the gift of friendship. Uh, could you tell us a little bit, give us insight into how somebody who in popular culture has the reputation of being a liberal could befriend a conservative and vice versa in Antonin Scalia? How did that happen? It was such a moving friendship, and they too bonded First over opera, he, he, you know, it's, if you like opera, then you're going to re really bond with those who love it as much as you do. But also, as she always said, he, you know, he drives me crazy, but he can make me laugh like no one else. And she acts, she's very, uh, she really has a great sense of humor. She, she doesn't crack a lot of jokes, but she just has a, a warm, uh, uproarious, appreciative laugh. And Scalia just cracked her up all the time. And they would get together for New Year's dinners cooked by her beloved husband, Marty, who we lost just a few years ago, who was a brilliant cook. Uh, and he would make these spectacular dinners. And afterward, uh, everyone would gather around the piano. And Scalia loved to sing. He uh, gave a performance at the Washington Opera that he called the three really famous tenors with two other judges, I think. <laughs> and, and, and they disagreed fiercely about the law, and she was not uh, happy at all about Bush v. Gore. She thought it was a disgrace, as she uh, told me and others. But after it was over, she was, uh, as she said in his eulogy, she's sitting in her chambers, just, they were all shell-shocked, and she gets a call, and it's Scalia, and he says, Ruth, what are you doing still at the court? Go home, take a warm bath. Excellent advice, she said, which I followed. And that reminded the country that there are things more important than even constitutional disagreements. You can disagree without being disagreeable. And the, although they disagreed profoundly about the Constitution, they really appreciated each other as human beings. There's a wonderful opera written by a University of Maryland law student called Scalia Ginsburg that the <laughs> National Constitution Center performed and, and Justice Ginsburg came to hear it. And the story basically is that there are two justices, uh, Scalia and Ginsburg, trapped on a desert island. And the only way that they can get off is by agreeing on a common theory of how to interpret the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> but the great fun of it is that they sing all of these arias uh, with brilliant lyrics set to familiar tunes. So when we performed it, I had the amazing pleasure of playing Name That Tune with Justice Ginsburg, as we heard. You know, that's uh, Carmen. She sings a lot of Carmen. Sc uh, Scalia sings a lot of Puccini. And it's the only opera I've ever heard that finds a rhyme for Craig v. Boren, which is a case from the <laughs> 1970s. Whitener's story in Craig v. Boren. You have to really be a geek to, to get the rhymes. But that just, she loved it, Scalia almost a little less, but he basically thought the guy had a First Amendment right to, to do it. <laughs> and it just encapsulates the fact that this, you know, this goes on in the court. Justice Kagan has said also that she was closest on the court to Justice Scalia. And Justice uh, Ginsburg told me in the book how, co how congenial she finds Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. So these are people who are 
for, you know, spend the rest of their lives together. They do get along as human beings. There are cross-partisan friendships, and it's a model for what America could be. That's really inspiring. I mean, isn't it? We have sort of constructed, I think, our national discourse is it's, it's us and them. We're othering other people and, and really just making cardboard cutouts of our ideological opponents. But this, this goes to show how shallow, how superficial that is it, it, at the level, the fierceness of these two intellects, how fierce they are in, in their ability to defend their positions and yet at a human level get along so beautifully. I mean, what an inspiration. I'm looking forward very much to, to learning more about that. Incorporating that at the Hauenstein Center in our Cook Leadership Academy with our, our students because they need to see these examples. So it's not so abstract out there. That's beautiful. Thanks for writing about that and bringing this to life. Thanks to her for allowing it. Well, you really are bringing, I think, up a topic that's near and dear to our heart. I think a lot of, there's something in the water here. You come back to Grand Rapids a lot. But I think you just quoted President Ford. He said, we should be able to disagree without being disagreeable. And President Ford was also, of course, known for having opponents but not enemies. It's a very, very important distinction. And could you please tell us about a very exciting initiative that will be launched between your organization in cooperation with the Atlantic tomorrow? Yes, thank you for asking. I'd be delighted. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't possibly. Just serendipitously <laughs> yeah. thought of that. Well, the timing of all of these great initiatives is so, is so synchronistic. And tomorrow, uh, the Atlantic and the National Constitution Center are going to launch a new website of constitutional debate. And we are bringing together uh, the top liberal, conservative, and libertarian scholars to write about the constitutional issues at the center of American life. And I'm going to launch it with an essay called The Fourth Battle for the Constitution, which is a version of the argument I just tried out on you. So if you think you're not convinced, let me know, because there's still time for editing after the show. <laughs> but otherwise, it'll be posted tomorrow morning. And then we're going to spend the next uh, you know, year until the election, and we hope uh, long after that, continuing to be a home for civil debate and constitutional dialogue. And there's a power, I haven't read the launch pieces, but there's a powerful one on the history of impeachment, I think by a conservative scholar. There, there's a, a great piece by uh, uh, Gregory Weiner, whose brilliant argument, Madison's metronome, says that the entire point of the Constitution was to slow down deliberation so that mobs couldn't form. Uh, a vision that's being undermined by social media and all sorts of other great pieces. And the other thing that's so exciting for the Constitution Center is that this site will host both our weekly We the People podcast, where every week I get to call up the leading liberal and conservative scholars in the country and have them debate the constitutional issue of the week. And I learned so much from these discussions, and some of them are historic. Last week we did Madison versus George Mason, the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists, and sometimes they're in the news, and it's always interesting and exciting when the liberal scholar in the Can the President Build the Wall podcast said, yes, he can build the wall under the Constitution, and the conservative scholar said, no, he can't. And I feel like I can't have an informed opinion on any constitutional issue in the news unless I hear people who really have dug into it and, and have listened to the arguments on both sides. So we have a, a passionate audience of about 100,000 listeners a week. I would love you all to listen if you like podcasts, and that'll be linked on the Atlantic site. And then the crown jewel of the Constitution Center's educational initiatives, the most meaningful educational initiative I've ever been involved in in my life, far more, which will outlive all of us at the Constitution Center long after we're gone is the upgraded interactive Constitution website. So just uh, last week on Constitution Day, we added to the existing essays by the liberal and conservative scholars the following features. The drafting table, which allows you to explore early drafts of every major provision of the Constitution. It's thrilling to see the revolutionary era state constitution that Madison cut and pasted from when he wrote the Bill of Rights, or to see early drafts of the 13th Amendment, which forbids slavery, which actually contained an equal protection clause. And it's both surprising and leads to uh, unexpected places and is such a rigorous nonpartisan way of studying the constitution. You can't argue with text and it's just a, a wonderful tool. And then 
All of the media products of the Constitution Center, the podcasts, the videos, the blogs, are all pegged to the amendment. So if you click on the Second Amendment, you'll see all the relevant <coughs> video and uh, educational content that is connected to it, including this wonderful, I, I know I sound like a Ginsu knife salesman right now, but there's more. <laughs> but I, and I just have to tell you about this incredible First Amendment initiative, which is on the interactive Constitution. So the College Board, which administers the advanced placement exams, has, uh, is recommending that all three to five million AP students study from the Constitution Center's First Amendment materials before they graduate from high school. There are two down weeks at the end of every AP class, so whether you take government or physics or Italian, the College Board is suggesting that uh, high school students learn from these materials. And they include lessons plans, which include uh, leading questions for students to debate, like can a school principal ban the Confederate flag on a backpack. They include videos about the First Amendment with Justice Kagan. And the culminating feature of this First Amendment initiative and the Interactive Constitution are these classroom exchanges that unite classrooms across the country for live discussions about the Constitution moderated by judges, lawyers, and master teachers. It's, wow, it's just amazing. So a classroom from Grand Rapids could connect to one in Kentucky or Philadelphia or uh, California for a half hour discussion. We've had federal judges. I just met uh, someone from your uh, bar association. I'd love to talk to you guys about getting involved as moderators. But you set a constitutional question, like the Confederate flag on the backpack. That's a question about which the lower courts have disagreed, so there's no really clear answer. The students will, before doing the exchange, read the materials and watch the videos so they have a foundation in the text and history. Then they'll have a debate and go back to their uh, classroom and connect with another one. I am so thrilled by this. I hope it'll transform the possibilities for civil dialogue in America. It's all linked on this amazing site, and it'll all be linked at The Atlantic, and the web is just such an exciting platform for spreading constitutional light and for education, as long as we have the discipline to use it in a deep way. Well, maybe you can come back to Grand Rapids and show us how it works. Well, I would be delighted to do that. People. That would be just great. I think great. you'd have a lot of willing participants here in the audience. That'd be great. We have some students I want to point out. We have a number of students from a high school who are in here, so this is something for you to really delve into. Okay, you. You engage so many different groups here in the country. I mean, around the country, you, you're talking to legal experts, judicial experts. You're talking to the public back at the Constitution Center. You, you host so many programs. So you, you, have a, you, you really have your finger on the pulse, I think, of what this country is thinking. I'm just curious, of all the things that you study and write about and of all the issues that you worry about, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> Nothing keeps me up at night. I sleep the sweet sleep of <laughs> lovers of the Constitution. <laughs> this is great because he calls his National Constitution Center's work home Constitution Heaven. It is constitutional heaven. How could one be kept up at night when you have the... John Marshall Harlan, the great dissenter in Plessy, was said to have gone to bed with a copy of the Bible in one hand and the Constitution in the other, and to sleep the sweet dreams of, 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 of sacred texts, I think. Because they so never I, contradicted, did they? No, no, absolutely not. It's perfect uh, synergy. So I, you know, uh, I, I, mean, I don't mean to be a meliorist or, or, or you know, uh, Panglossian about the divisions in this country. This is the most polarized time since the Civil War, so we've got, we've got some deep political problems, but I, I, I've never met a group that hasn't left me feeling optimistic and inspired about the possibility for constitutional debate. All you have to do is just what we're doing together. We, we start by agreeing to set aside our politics, and then you respect citizens of any background and any age to elevate themselves, cultivate their faculties, learn enough to have an informed opinion before reaching a quick judgment and be open to changing your mind or to opening your mind to the arguments on the other side. And everyone from middle school kids to adult learners, eight to 80, uh, rises to the occasion. So I, that, I think it's just a, a, a framing device. If, if, the better, if, we, if we summon the better, better angels of our nature, nature, realize we're not gonna agree about politics, uh, and realize that we can learn enough to debate intelligently about the Constitution, then I think we will be saved. 
Okay, very good. Well, you know what they say. They say there are two kinds of progressives, those progressives who think that we're getting progressively better every day and those progressives who think we're getting progressively worse huh. every day. I think you definitely belong in the former camp. Well, I'm not allowed to be a progressive at all. No, I, have no, I have no politics whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I am an optimist, very, very much so. And, very and, good. Yeah. Uh, really good questions are coming in. And so uh, this one really strikes me uh, of all the questions received so far. How many presidents have defied the Constitution? And wow. specific examples. That is or such say, a great question. Yeah. The, Best examples. In yeah. You know, I think we'd have to run through each of them to think about, you know, because there, are, there were certainly constitutional conflicts in all of the presidencies. Even Washington, there were, there were no precedents for whether he was e even allowed to receive foreign ambassadors. Uh, and uh, he decided that that power gave him some diplomatic authority. But the first big constitutional conflict was the election of 1800. And Jefferson, by his own lights, violated the Constitution with the Louisiana Purchase. All of his strict constructionist impulses were violated by what he viewed as this uh, urgently invaluable opportunity to double the size of the US. And then the um, deadlock over the election of 1800 uh, with Jefferson and Burr tying led to the 12th Amendment, which recognized the rise of political parties, ensured that the president and vice president could never run against each other again, and also changed the function of the electoral college. So th that would be the first great constitutional conflict. And we can keep running up from them. But I guess if the spirit of the question is really which president was most defiant of constitutional norms, and let's stick to early, uh, even 19th century examples, certainly Jackson had the most uh, ag ag aggressive uh, insistence that he had an independent authority to judge constitutionality. And when he withdrew funds from the National Bank, I will kill this bank, he said. It was because he opposed it on constitutional terms. And his veto message for the second bank clearly made clear that he thought it exceeded Congress's power to regulate uh, uh, commerce and exceeded the bounds of the necessary and proper clause. He was a good lawyer and a former judge, and he is clearly making his views clear. He probably didn't say John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it in the Cherokee Indians case. And when Marshall died, he paid tribute to the great chief's uh, sagacity. But he was the first populist president who s claimed to derive his authority directly from the people rather than from the Constitution. And then I would just fast forward to the next two populists. Uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt and William Howard Taft. Taft is another hero of mine because I was given as a homework assignment to write this short biography of him, uh, also with the riveting and creative title, William Howard Taft. <laughs> and, and, and he was the last president to oppose the idea that the executive had a direct mandate from the people. He fights the election of 1912 on the grounds that both Roosevelt and Wilson are demagogues by claiming a direct populist mandate, and he believes that the Madisonian Constitution must be preserved against demagogues and the mob. So it's helpful to realize that our current debates about populism versus constitutionalism are not uh, dating from uh, 2016. Uh, they go back to the Jacksonian era, but they really got up and running during the election of 1912. George Will came to the Constitution Center not long ago. He has a great new book out called The Conservative Sensibility. And he said the way to tell who is a conservative today is to ask who he or she would have voted for in the election of 1912. And conservatives, he say, would have voted for Taft. And if you voted for Roosevelt or Wilson, you're a progressive. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. And George Will, we have to say, we were talking about this earlier today, has really changed a lot. I mean, he's, his, his um, what, what he defines as a conservative sensibility has undergone a metamorphosis. He's, he's become a passionate libertarian yes. devotee of natural law limitations on government power. And uh, it's very uh, powerful case for the natural law constitution. And when, we, when he came to the center, I just uh, respectfully 
questioned him about how, given his former concerns about judicial activism, namely judges second-guessing too many political decisions, he was now a fan of what he called judicial engagement, namely judges vigorously checking the executive Congress and state legislatures in the name of natural rights. And he said, well, judges may not be perfect, but I can't think of any alternatives. <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really fascinating evolution. He's such a principled conservative. A couple of times now, this is a question that's come up I think three different times in the cards. You've talked about natural law and the importance of natural law earlier in our history. Well, this questioner just very frankly asked, what is natural law? Mm. How do we know it exists? And how does natural law inform the Declaration and the Constitution in three minutes or less? <laughs> it's, you know, it's a crucial question. I'm it's so glad you question. asked it. We yes. must understand it. I quoted the second sentence of the Declaration when Jefferson talked about unalienable rights, he meant natural rights. And he had a very clear conception of what natural rights were. And it came from Locke and Francis Hutcheson and Jean-Jacques Burlamaki. You've heard of John Locke, probably not those other guys who were heroes of the Scottish Enlightenment. But I'll try to do it in three minutes or less, because I obviously had to read up on this, so I understood what the framers were thinking. Locke and the natural law theorists, like Jefferson, believed that we're all born in a state of nature with certain natural rights, that is, rights that come from God or nature, not from government. They are inherent in us as human beings. When we move from the state of nature to form governments or civil society, we surrender or alienate to government temporary control over some of our natural rights in order to obtain greater security and safety of the natural rights that we have retained. For example, we give to government the power to punish private violence so that we will be more secure and safe. Whenever government threatens our natural rights and liberties, rather than protecting them, we have not only a right but a duty to alter and abolish it. That's why the right of revolution declared in the Declaration is itself an unalienable right because I can't surrender to government the power to enforce the social contract when government breaks it. So both the right of revolution and the right of amendment are themselves unalienable and can't be surrendered to government. What is the other quintessential unalienable right? The rights of conscience, the right to believe or not to believe as I please. That can include religious belief, and it can also include my thoughts, sensations, and opinions. Why is conscience unalienable? There is a technical answer offered up by Hutchison, because my I'm a creature of reason. These are people of the Enlightenment. My thoughts are involuntary thoughts presented to my reasoning mind. They're the product of my external experiences and sensations operating on my reason. I can't alienate or surrender to you the power to control my thoughts because I can't entirely control them myself. They're a combination of sensations, experiences, and reason. So because I cannot alienate my reasoning powers to government or to you, Conscience is unalienable, and that's why all the revolutionary era state constitutions talk about the rights of conscience as the quintessential natural right, and the New Hampshire Constitution literally says much more eloquently than I just did. Fast in its preamble, we're born with natural rights. The first one is the right of conscience. Here's why it can't be alienated. Whenever it's threatened, then we have to exercise the right of revolution. So all of that's, that's what Jefferson was talking about. Now, what's the... I, uh, maybe two more minutes for, the, for, for what's the relation okay. with the Constitution. It's all right. Really, uh, the Constitution was meant to ensure that the people's natural rights were protected rather than threatened. And the first, uh, and, and, the, and the, uh, the other quintessential uh, unalienable right was popular sovereignty. We, the people as a whole, are sovereign because we, the people as a whole, make the social contract and we can enforce it through the right of revolution. James Wilson wrote the very first draft of the Constitution Center. At the Constitution Center, we have Wilson's first draft. It's amazing. It blows your mind. It's even more rare than the copy in the National Archives because it's the first time anyone ever put pen to paper about the Constitution. The first words of the Constitution that Wilson wrote were, Resolve that the government of the United States shall consist of a legislative, judicial, and executive branch. Separation of powers. It was not we the people. Why? Because Wilson had to ensure that 
no single branch could speak for we the people. Only we the people, through our constitution, could be sovereign, and power had to be separated and checked to ensure that the people remain the masters and the legislators and uh, representatives their servants. The second draft, written by Wilson, says we the people of the states of New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Providence Plantation, and so forth, ordained the Constitution. The third draft says we the people of the United States. Why? Because Wilson stood up in the convention and said that we the people as a whole are sovereign. The whole people has made the Constitution. Therefore, the whole people is necessary before it can be altered. That's why they took out the we the people of the states of and signaled the sovereignty of we the people of the United States. Lincoln invokes Wilson's speech in the convention when he denies the power of the South to secede. The South is saying, we the people of the states are sovereign. But Lincoln says, no. Wilson assured us when the framers made the Constitution that the whole people are sovereign, and it took the Civil War to settle that question. And Lincoln also, and this is the relation to the Declaration, stands in front of Independence Hall in 1861 and says, I have never had a thought that did not stem from Jefferson's declaration. I would rather be assassinated on this spot hmm. than abandon the principles of the Declaration of Independence. It's un oh. It makes you gasp. And at the Constitution Center, we just opened an exhibit on the Civil War and Reconstruction that has the flag that flew over Independence Hall when Lincoln made his speech. So Lincoln believed that the principles of Jefferson's declaration, natural law principles, were codified in the Constitution, that the original Constitution betrayed them by denying the equal liberty of all human beings, and that the second uh, Constitution, the Reconstruction Amendments, were necessary to perfect it. So that's a stab at it. I'm so sorry that that was too long, but it's such an important and interesting. Well, we have a couple of questions here. They're also real easy ones, softball. How's the Second Amendment going to be resolved? Huh. <laughs> you know, the Second Amendment. Kind of a lightning round here. No. I, I, OK, I'll do it as fast as I can, because they're good, they're good questions. So and remember, I'm just describing. I'm not taking, I'm not taking sides here. So what, first of all, if we are not passing gun control legislation in this country, it's not the fault of the Supreme Court. Because the Supreme Court said in the Heller decision that reasonable regulations, just as Scalia said, including restrictions on felons having firearms or guns at schools and other uh, regulations, are perfectly permissible with the Second Amendment as an individual right. And lower courts have upheld most regulations that they have considered since the Heller decision in 2010, including bans on AK-47s and other uh, contested regulations. Now, the Supreme Court just this term agreed to hear one Second Amendment case about whether you, New York could ban someone from moving a licensed legal gun from the home to a shooting range out of state that was so constitutionally vulnerable that New York repealed the law to try to moot out the case and prevent the court from hearing it, and they've asked the justices not to hear it. But just last week, there's an AK-47 case um, of, uh, that the court's being asked to hear, and the lower courts are beginning to divide on that question. Justices Thomas and Gorsuch have argued that the court is treating the Second Amendment as a second-class right by refusing to hear Second Amendment cases, and they seem to be willing to recognize a higher level of scrutiny, which basically means treating the Second Amendment more like the First Amendment and more skeptically evaluating restrictions on gun rights and requiring a higher degree of justification. So that's where we're at as a matter of law. As a matter of history, here's what I learned from the interactive Constitution. First, if you look at the revolutionary era state constitutions that Madison cut and paste from, on the drafting table tool, it was just mind-blowing to learn because I hadn't seen it before, that two out of the original 13 state constitutions recognized a natural right of self-defense, Vermont and Pennsylvania. All the other states talk about the right of well-regulated militias and not to be <coughs> disbanded by the federal government. Why do they do that? Well, the common explainer, written by the leading liberal and conservative scholars on the Second Amendment, Adam Winkler and Nelson Lund, strong conservative and strong liberal, they agreed on the interactive constitution that this was the central purpose of the Second Amendment. The, the anti-federalists are really concerned that now that the federal government has total power over the militia, that it's going to create standing armies that will come and 
take away citizens' liberties. And they want to ensure that the people can organize themselves into militias so that if a tyrannical federal government tries to quarter troops in the home or take away liberty or infringe free speech, then the people can take up arms to defend themselves. It was a, 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 a total agreement that the federal government has complete power over the uh, militias, but also a disagreement about whether the militias themselves are going to be armed enough to resist federal tyranny. That's not a question we're thinking much about now. It doesn't settle the question of whether AK-47s are constitutional or not. There are good arguments on both sides, I suppose, about whether AK-47s are constitutional. Our liberal scholar, Adam Lund, said, yes, those AK-47 bans are absolutely constitutional. Most lower courts have upheld them, and the framers uh, upheld all sorts of reasonable regulations of muskets, including the requirement that you present your muskets for public inspection to make sure that they were safe. The conservative scholar, Nelson Lund, said, no, bans on AK-47s are not constitutional, not because you couldn't ban really dangerous weapons, but he said there's no closed class of weapons called AK-47s or assault rifles. He said it's like calling French fries freedom fries. It's too ill-defined to give people proper notice about what's being banned. So you can decide for yourself where, what you find is more convincing there. But what I'm hoping you're getting a sense of is it really isn't a sense of if you're in favor of gun rights, you want the Supreme Court to strike down all regulations and the Second Amendment commands it and vice versa. The Second Amendment has this complicated history rooted mostly in the desire to allow citizens to defend themselves against federal tyranny. It was refined during Reconstruction when racist mobs were attacking the freedmen and uh, the framers of the 14th Amendment wanted to ensure that African Americans would have the right to defend themselves against mob violence. So that right of self-defense becomes more acute during the Civil War. And then the question of how to apply all this to modern technologies is just as hard for the Second Amendment as it is for the Fourth Amendment and whether the Fourth Amendment should prohibit the government from tracking our movements in public 24-7 using our cell phone data, which the Supreme Court has unanimously said they can't do. So all of these are hard questions. How you answer them will depend, I hope, not on what your position on gun rights, but on which constitutional methodology you adopt. I'm such a wonkish law professor that I want to urge you to learn about the methodologies of constitutional interpretation. This is what law students learn, but this is also what the justices, this is what, how they decide cases, not am I a liberal or a conservative, but am I a, there are, there are five or six or eight of them, Am I a textualist, someone who believes the constitutional text should rule? Am I an originalist, like Justice Scalia and Thomas, who believes that the original public meaning of the Constitution should rule? Do I care about precedent, like Justice David Souter and what the Supreme Court has said about the issue before? Am I a natural law constitutionalist, like George Will, who thinks that the shining values of the Constitution, the liberties uh, promised therein, should be protected whether or not they're enumerated in the Constitution? Am I a pragmatist like Justice Breyer who thinks that the government is supposed to be a practical series of accommodations among the branches and the Supreme Court should help it work by considering the practical consequences of its decisions? Or like Justice Ginsburg, do I believe in the, the technical term is representation reinforcement, uh, but it comes from a case uh, decided in 1938 called the Caroline Products case, which basically said after the New Deal crisis, if it's an economic regulation, the court is generally going to uphold it. But if the regulation either violates one of the rights enumerated in the Bill of Rights or threatens the rights of underrepresentative minorities who may not be able to fend for themselves in the political process, then the court will more skeptically evaluate it. So that's Justice Ginsburg's theory that Economic regulations generally get deference, but laws that uh, threaten um, minorities and the Bill of Rights are more skeptically scrutinized. I just gave you, you don't have to go to take my con law class anymore, because that's basically what you <laughs> get out of it, is those eight methodologies. But it's interesting. And, and when you look at the Supreme Court opinions, realize that Justice Gorsuch may thinks of himself as an originalist, but Justice Roberts is more of a institutionalist, or, or, or Justice Ginsburg cares about representation reinforcement, and Breyer is more of a pragmatist. That's why you get these unexpected alliances on the court. Last term, Justice, Gin Justice Kavanaugh noted when he was with us at the Constitution Center, he and Justice Ginsburg were the two only dissenters in a case 
where the court said that it was okay to try someone twice for the same state offense. Justices Ginsburg and, Kep and, and uh, uh, Gorsuch thought that violated the double jeopardy clause uh, because of their uh, different methodologies but shared uh, a commitment to the text of the Constitution. So that's a long way of saying that the Second Amendment is complicated. Uh, there is a base history that we can agree on and its current applications are contested. And w whatever happens, the Supreme Court is neither going to save or uh, exacerbate the uh, gun question in this country. Thank you, Professor Rosen. You've taken us to school this <laughs> evening. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Great job. Thank you. Great job.